Hello everyone, this is Philosophy for the People of Stephen Bertram and Ben Burgess and this week we're talking about religion in a different way to than how we have previously. Um, the essay this week is on whether religion will wither away uh, as, as Ben thinks, Marx thinks. Um, but I, I, the question I had reading the essay was, well, what exactly do we mean by religion? Yeah. Uh, so the yes, the title of the essay is I'm a Marxist and atheist, but I don't think that religion would uh, wither away under socialism. Uh, and what I'm talking about is this classic sort of much quoted um, passage where Marx says that religion is the opiate of the people. Uh, that's the that's kind of the most famous uh, snippet of it, and people will often, um, you know, people will often uh, sort of uh, either quote that or something. I you know, I, like I see a lot is people saying, okay, everybody knows the religion is the opiate of the people, but people don't know the context. And look, this is actually a much more nuanced view if you look at all the stuff that he says uh, surrounding it. Um, and, you know, what I'm trying to, to do in the essay is two things. One is to figure out what Marx means, uh, and the other is to, you know, think about the extent to which he's right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as far as what we mean by religion, uh, you know, Marx himself doesn't specify, of course, in that, uh, in that passage, it probably seemed uh, obvious at the time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, he you know he kind of starts it out. This is the introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, uh, sort of really important piece of early uh, early Marx, and uh, he's you know and he he just starts talking about like criticism of religion, uh, and uh, yeah, doesn't really say what he means by by religion. So, which is why I say. In the first footnote, I actually had this. Uh, the original version of it was a little bit stronger, and then somebody pointed out that it was probably stronger than it needed to be. And so I, I just kind of say in the footnote that, um, you know, religion, and I, I'm trying here to just follow Marx's usage of the term, uh, is, you know, so when I talk about religion or religious beliefs, um, that's a little bit vague, but it's surely supposed to at least include. Uh, the sorts of beliefs that are foundational to, um, you know, Western monotheisms, you know, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you know, whatever else it might or might not also include. Right. Well, I mean, my my concern with you know what is religion is you talk about kind of you know the number of of, of people who are atheistic has gone up recently. You expect it to go up more, but not to disappear. Um, but my inclination to say is that beyond the number of atheists increasing, also religions are becoming less religious. Yeah. Um, like you, you, you talk about, um, you know, that there's some efforts to kind of disengage kind of the practices of religion from any kind of from metaphysics of just having it to be like a comforting community or like a social place or whatever, like humanist temples or humanist yeah. churches or whatever. Um, but you say these efforts have failed. But for me, I'm like, well, that just sounds like Anglicanism. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, to to an extent, right? I mean, I think there's a, you know, there's a spectrum, um, and I, yeah. So I mean, it, it would have been like definitely an extra layer, you know, it would have been a longer essay if I'd, uh, you know, if I'd gotten into this. But you know, there is like an interesting further question about. Uh, like degrees of how seriously you take uh, underlying uh, underlying religious claims, uh, the, the the metaphysical parts, and so stuff like um, uh, Anglicanism. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm actually trying to remember who I'm stealing this from because I saw this this line uh, a week or two ago. Uh, where somebody said um, they were describing, I 
think this was a no. I think this is something I heard on a Chapo episode. I think this is something <laughs> Ruben said uh, that uh, I don't remember how it came up. They're talking about Episcopalianism, which is the the U.S. version of Anglicanism, and uh, and he said uh, that Episcopalianism uh, makes Reform Judaism look like snake handling. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I think I heard the same episode. Uh, um, I didn't realize it was. Um... It was American anglicism. It was just some yeah, foreign yeah, thing to me, which yeah. I laughed at because the words sounded funny. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so there is like a there is a question there because it's it's certainly. Uh, I mean, I, I think that you know, liberal religion right is the as the subject right. I mean, I think that uh, like, I mean, I think there. I think there's an interesting question about the distinction between that and just sort of going all the way to saying you know let's just forget you know like like in other words like liberal religion tends you know in the sense that i'm using the term here not like politically liberal but like theologically liberal uh you know tends to you know vague up uh the uh the underlying metaphysical claims um and you know i think there's an interesting question about the line between sort of uh vaguing up and give it up on entirely right that the uh, right so- because m- m- my idea is that kind of religion will wither away in the sense that at some point it'll become so unrecognizable um that it can't be identified by you know what we currently talk about um and there are two things you highlight as kind of features of religion i don't know if in- explicitly like you're thinking about them in those terms you just kind of mentioned them uh, but before we get to that you should probably go through kind of what what you take to be Mar- Marx's. Sure. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, oh, by the way, before you begin, shout out to everyone that's listening to us, to us on Vaughn's channel. We're not meant to be live there, but hello. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. All right. Um, yeah. So what do I, um, I think that you know, so Marx says in this famous uh, passage from the introduction, the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, that uh, you know, criticism starts with uh, criticism of uh, of religion and the, the sort of demand for, you know, the end of religion. It's uh, the, you know, demand for the end of religious illusions is, is really the demand for the end of a condition that uh, that requires illusions, and there is a suggestion in here, which again is just one of these wrinkles I, I didn't get into, but uh, I think maybe partially because I, I was wasn't really sure what to say about this part, right? That there is like a little bit of ambiguity in this discussion about the extent to which um, the. Uh, to the extent to which Marx might be claiming, or at least implying here, that uh, that getting you know that like some of the process might have to go the other way around, that you know that there's mm-hmm. some uh, that you have to to you know rid yourself of, of illusions in order to uh, get uh, get past uh, the uh, the condition, because um, the you know the sort of when the poetry kind of gets best at the end of the passage, he he does sort of seem to be saying that he says that. Uh, you know, the uh, criticism is plucked the flower from the chain, not so that, you know, it can bear the chain without the flower, but so it can cast off the chain and, you know, pluck the living flower. Um, and uh, so, you know, to, again, the, the extent to which Marx might be saying that, the extent to which early Marx might have believed that uh, is is an interesting question, but it's not one that we're getting into. In the essay, um, what, what interests me is the part that's the the other way around, right? You know, so so assuming that um, you know, assuming that lots of people you know are are still religious at at the point where you know, society transitions to to socialism, uh, then uh, then what you know what happens after that? Uh, and the you know the idea when he talks about you know, religious illusions and the condition that requires illusions. Uh, One thing that does seem to be reasonably clear about what he's saying is that class society is a condition that requires illusions that, you know, once once we get past 
you know, class society, you know, then we would no longer be in a condition that, um, that requires illusions. And, you know, this is, um, you know, like, this is a pattern of Marx's thought that he thinks about a lot of things that there are certain, uh, there are various kinds of illusions that you can't, uh, you, you sort of, um, you know, you can't defeat intellectually uh, because they have they have deeper sources than that. Real illusions, as Daniel Dennett would say. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? Uh, so as opposed to like hallucinations that go away once you realize that it's not really there, um, that, uh, that, these, uh, that there are other kinds of illusions that are more like, you know, the analogy of saying it's like a desert mirage where it's still... Um, you could understand perfectly that you're, you know, that it's a mirage, that it's not really there, and that doesn't impact your visual experience at all. You're still, you're still seeing it, um, and and I think this is so. This is this is, for example, um, you know, part of Marx's point about uh, commodity fetishism in uh, in Capital that the way that in Marx's analysis the sort of uh, social relations between people take the form of these autonomous relations between things that you know that the commodities themselves are exerting you know this this power this this is an illusion but it's not an illusion that can be cured by reading the commodity a fetishism chapter of capital you won't actually start to experience any of this differently uh once you've you know carefully gone through it with your reading group and you know felt sure that you under understand it, you know, you're still gonna, you're still gonna, ex you like, you're still going to have the same experience of life under capitalism that you had before, because it's, it's just that experience, even though in an important sense, it's illusory, it's just a function of the way that the system is set up. Uh, and but, but you don't think in that sense, that sense that we, we can't see past this thing, and certainly, in that sense, religion has withered away. Yeah, um, right. I mean, so there's an interesting question about whether religion, religious illusions, were ever quite as strong as that. Uh, so, uh, I, I think it's it's kind of easy to assume that they were. Uh, that um, so. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Actually, as I'm thinking about it, uh, so. Uh, that like there's just a time when like nobody uh, could uh, could imagine could imagine any of this being uh, being false and and I am inclined to think you know that doesn't seem to be at least as true about the time in question as we might think uh, there's a uh, there's a fascinating lecture from uh, Gresham College that I direct people out about this this uh, Alex Ryrie uh, it's called How to Be an Atheist in Medieval Europe. And he's looking at all these like old like court records of uh, of of like people you know who are like found themselves hauled before a church court because they you know they said there's no god or something like that and mm -hmm. uh, it's um, and you know I mean it, it is interestingly really different uh, from uh, from from modern atheism because uh, it's and it's sort of uh, less obviously justified uh, that like it's you know because all you know, all possible educated opinion goes against it, etc. Like any like, but he's like a scholar who spends their time thinking about it is going to tell you that you're wrong. But like, it's just sort of the, um, it's a, it's this kind of like the stuff you do seem that does seem to pop up every once in a while in medieval Europe is like uh, this kind of like bar stool sort of like I don't know that sounds like bullshit to me. Uh, sort of. Uh, I mean, but yeah, but I mean, surely there were also like a few people who were like, what if we got rid of landlords? <laughs> right. Uh, probably actually way more of the second thing than the first one, but uh, I mean probably a lot of the second one, but without kind of a concept of like we're like what, we'll what, have feudal relations, we just won't have a king. We'll yeah, just do yeah, feudalism yeah. amongst ourselves. Yeah, right. Like yeah, how people yeah. imagine socialism as just kind of like cooperatives competing with each other or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh yeah. Um I mean I think that there's I mean, actually, that is a—I mean, whatever. Don't want to get too sidetracked on this, but that is an interesting question because, uh, I mean, you do get like, 
I mean, the more of this history you read, I mean, it does seem like, you know, there are like a, uh, like peasant revolts or things that happen with like way more regularity than you'd expect. Uh, and... I mean, and I guess for, for Marx and for Marxists, it's not that interesting to wonder about kind of what a very small share of the population thought, right? But rather to think about kind of what the possibilities of thought were for most people. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was going to say, I think probably most peasant revolts uh, were... Uh, reformist. Reformist, exactly. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I, I think you probably will find people here and there who are like, no, seriously, but like, what if we just don't need any of this? And they have a really hazy idea at best about what, what could exist instead. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that it's, um, I, I think it is almost certainly true that um, the possibilities of thought for certainly a larger segment of the population expanded considerably uh, at the, the dawn of capitalism uh, scientific revolution or, you know, um, uh, kind of, you know, like there's a lot that was going on that, you know, that, that I think lent itself, uh, towards that. So, you know, the commodity fetishism thing is not a perfect analogy. Um, but it's, uh, but, but I think the, the comparison is that there are these sort of deeper than intellectual, uh, sources of the uh, of the illusion, right? That e even though, like, clearly not everybody is equally susceptible to it, uh, and you know, surely fewer people, you know, more people are capable of of you know intellectually resisting it than uh, than was the case in medieval Europe by a lot, right? But um, it's it's still uh, you know it's still the case that. Um, you know, the, you know, Marx. Marx thinks that um, that there are again, there are these deeper sources. There are sources of religious belief that are non-rational, and uh, and that the it's going to uh, uh, that you know there aren't you know in other words that people um, that the like something that that like very rarely happens is I mean I'm not I'm not going to say never but you know very rarely uh, is that somebody's entire reason for believing in the existence of God is that they uh, read Alvin Plantinga or something. And, uh, you know, yeah, the idea is very funny. Like, yeah, you're just like, oh my God, you're right, right? There is a God. Uh, how could I be so foolish? Um, like again, not gonna say never, but like I don't think that's the typical experience, right? I mean, I think that the, I think that typically people have a lot more sort of basic reasons uh, for believing, and maybe you know, maybe the plan or whatever helps them feel better about it because it sort of shores up some doubts. But uh, but it's it, you know, it, and uh, helps sort of keep them that way. But like that's not really the main reason that they're. Uh, that they're religious. Um, and, you know, I think they're probably real, you know, accepting all this so far, right? I mean, I think everything so far is just like obviously true. Uh, the, then, you know, the next question is, okay, well, if it's not, you know, the args, then, uh, then, then what is it, right? You know, like, what, like, what is this sort of, uh, enduring appeal, and at least in the introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, Marx's answer seems to be uh, suffering. Right, that the uh, that it's uh, that you know, like the sort of enduring source of you know of the appeal, even in modern society, etc., of what he sees as religious illusions uh, are is uh, you know is the sort of consolation it provides for suffering. That's the, the, the sign of the oppressed. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, so yes, as the, yes, heart of a heartless world, you know, the sigh of the oppressed, the opening of the people. Uh, and I want to, so I, I think everything so far, like right up until that point seems 
totally right to me. Uh, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, you know, I certainly, look, I, I certainly agree as I've, you know, I've, I've gone on and on about before, right. That the, uh, the orgs are not good, right. You know, that the, uh, that like, if we're making an intellectual judgment here, that, uh, that, you know, most, you know, it's overwhelmingly likely that these beliefs are false. Um, I certainly agree that uh, there are sort of deeper sources than being, you know, taken in by the ARGs uh, that uh, that fuel religious belief. Uh, I think whether or not it's the whole truth, which we can certainly get to in a second, it's certainly at least part of the truth that, you know, oppression has something to do with it. You know, that, that, that clearly uh, people who are, experiencing kinds of misery that result from society being organized the way that it is, uh, you know, poverty, you know, like, uh, et cetera, right? It's like, you know, if you go back far enough, like are, are things that uh, it's, you know, it's easier to get through if you, if you have the belief that, uh, you know, this, this life isn't the only one that there is that, uh, that, there's a there's a plan and you know and this is this is just you know this is all part of it and you know and it's going to work out for the best in the end etc. Uh, I think that's all true, but where I get off board is with the idea that it's only an opiate of uh, you know the people in the sense of like the people as opposed to you know the um, uh, as opposed to some sort of elite group, or it's it's that it's uh, you know it's it's only the side of of the oppressed, right? The uh, the like I basically my you know critique of um, of what Marx is saying here is two things. Um, one is that uh, I think that there are you know. Whereas consolation for suffering is certainly a major uh, non-intellectual source of religious belief, I don't think it's the only one. I think that there are there are other sources, um, and you know, I, I think people have, um, you know, I, I think for various reasons uh, and in various circumstances, people have feelings, and intense experiences, etc. That um, that lend themselves to religious interpretation and that you know, religion helps them to make sense of. Uh, but I also, I also think putting that aside even, that you know, my, my sort of most basic beef with Marx's analysis in this passage is that, look, I mean, the condition that requires illusions is to some extent just the condition of being a person. Right, and you, you highlight in the essay two kind of things which you think people will always kind of like, well, you highlight a few, but two, two that I kind of thought were important was, you know, the idea that we're, we're mortal and the idea that we'll die, um, and this applies to everyone, right? Um, so what, when one is kind of the belief that another life is an important form of consolation, and the other one is that, you know, regardless of, of what happens, uh, horrible, unpredictable things can can still happen, and in those circumstances, it is again kind of psychologically useful to believe there's someone out there with a plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like uh, it's that you know, it, if it's, uh, I mean, it's it is really distressing uh, to uh, uh, to believe that. You know, horrible shit just happens, and there's no uh, rhyme or reason to it. It doesn't serve any sort of larger good. It's uh, uh, you know, it didn't have to happen. You know, etc. Like that's a that's a hard thing to uh, that's a hard thing to believe. Uh, it's it's very it's very tempting and attractive uh, to, uh, to to think otherwise. You know that like uh, that you know like. Just the idea that it's all kind of chaos is distressing, and the idea that they, that ultimately somebody's in charge and they have a plan is uh, is very comforting. 
And then, yeah, I mean, people, um, like, even if you're not being oppressed and all of your material needs are met, um, then it's, you know, it's still the case that, you know, sickness and accidents, and, you know, like, like horrible things are going to happen to people you care about, people you care about are going to die, you're going to die. Uh, and, you know, that's like, I, I'm not breaking any new ground here when I say that that's, uh, that that's a thought that it is incredibly difficult for a lot of people to, to properly come to terms with. I mean, I guess my question would be, Doctor Doctor Smurfo uh, is is of course is of course says the most important thing ultimately here, and I you know I I, I endorse the uh, the scientific method of display there. Um, if we we just kind of take the idea of you know these two things of needing an explanation for kind of the ordering of the world, and kind of a question or an answer about life after death and so on. Would then something like the simulation hypothesis not be able to fulfill these things? And would that function? Would that be a religion or something that functions as a religion? Or if we, we imagine kind of it, it answers both questions in the sense, you know, we're being simulated and, you know, I don't know, they'll probably keep our bits around when we die and just cycle us back in or something. I don't know. There could be various answers, but there, 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 there are answers there, you know. Yeah, maybe. That's, uh, uh, I mean, I was about to say yes, but then that last part doesn't actually sound very satisfying, you know. But I, I don't know if my uh, all right, sure, but you can come up with a version which would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can say we all, we all go to techno heaven, sure, yeah. I and mean, sometimes I'll uh, like you know, talk to people who uh, uh, you know, who are more sympathetic than I am to the idea of reincarnation, and they'll be like, well, even if it's not one to one, you there's still you know, like maybe, you know, there's some sort of like mental stuff and that like, you know, that's, that's not just material. Maybe that becomes the new person. It's like, okay, I don't know why I should care about that though. Right. I mean, like if that's, that doesn't sound like I'll be any less dead. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that something like that maybe could, right. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, this is definitely, um, this is definitely something that's hard to um, like I think that I mean I mean I think a different way of asking the question and this is like that that comment the same comment that got me to, to soften that first footnote about you know exactly what I meant by religious belief uh, comment on the substack you know sort of was was hinting at the same thing which is basically um, okay, maybe we don't, you know, like, even if I'm right, and, you know, uh, that, like, contrary to early Marx, it's not just that, you know, class society is a condition that requires illusions, it's that the human condition is a condition that requires illusions in the same sense. I mean, obviously, plenty of people bear, you know, like, pay plenty of, there are plenty of people who you know, who live in grinding poverty and continue to not have any religious beliefs, right? So clearly right. some people can bear the, the condition of class society without illusions, but, you know, some people can't. And, you know, in my basic hypothesis, the same thing seems to be true. Oh, yeah, right? they can just come up with materialist illusions, right? They can delude themselves, they're going to win the lottery or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's, um, uh, but, like, in this sense in which you might say class society is a condition that requires illusions, that, you know, I think the human condition is a condition that requires illusions. Basically, I think what your objection and then Gareth's objection and comment, I think both get down to is, hey, um, okay, that could be true, but like also maybe the illusions could mutate to such an extent that the sort of arguments about whether there's a God exactly that you know, I kind of talk about at the beginning of the essay, are no longer exactly relevant, and um, that could be true. I mean, I think that's that's like like really you know really hard to. Uh... <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, good good point, Sean. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good inversion of Marx. Yeah, it is right um, that. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. I, do, I always do admire people who say the opposite of what is true 
compared to people who are only like 50% wrong. <laughs> like, be, I think being perfectly wrong is like the closest position to being perfectly right. Right, 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 right. Because <laughs> at least you, uh, yeah, at least you have some sense of, you know, of, of how the ideas are related to each other, even if you're stringing them together wrong. Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, so yeah, I think this could be true. I mean, you were kind of joking like a couple weeks ago when we first uh, talked about doing, you know, that I was going to do an essay about this, you know, you made a joke about like sociology for the people, you know, that like, um, right. it was cause like, you know, come on, how would we know? Right. You know, uh, and, and I think that's, I think that's fair to a certain extent. And I think it's like, and I think when it comes to the like mutation hypothesis, then it gets like particularly fair. Right. Cause, cause sure. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Right. I mean, it's like, yeah. You know, Christianity has existed for a couple thousand years, and you know, Judaism for a couple thousand years longer, or whatever. But like, you know, basically, like that's uh, that's not that long as far as all of human history goes. Um, and whereas I think that sometimes people would make a mistake of saying, well, X arose in such and such historical circumstances, therefore, when the historical circumstances change, like X will go away. It's like, well, that doesn't necessarily follow, right? I mean, like it could right. be. It could be that it could only have arisen in these circumstances, but once <laughs> it's like someone in enslaved society being like, "Oh, in the transition to feudalism, money is going to disappear." Yeah, yeah exactly, right? <laughs> you know, like it's like, oh, no, not necessarily, right? Clearly, um, and you know, so I, I think it could be that even though, even though, like the Western monotheisms, you know, arose in a certain historical era and bear the stamp of it, you know, that, like. That doesn't tell us anything by itself about how long, uh, how long they'll they'll last, or you know, or, or even if they'll ever go away entirely. But uh, but you know, it, it's not it's not a crazy suggestion that um, that like future forms of you know religious consolation and sort of religious explanation of reality could could like mutate in some crazy way that we can't imagine right now. Maybe, maybe even the, the, Catholic, the Catholic Church is the leading Italian American cultural association on Neptune. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, I really, I really hope that the. Uh, I mean, I already, I already think it's pretty funny that uh, I was talking to our uh, live show producer Jordan about this the other day. Like, I already think it's pretty funny that, like, in two thousand twenty-three. That you know, there are still cities where you get like the uh, the like ethnic cuisine and neighborhoods and stuff is as sharply defined as it is. Like right. if you, you know, if you go to like you know the the line between like North Beach and Chinatown in San Francisco, it's like how is it that there isn't a single Italian restaurant spilling over into this side of the street, you know, or vice versa, right? Like is this you know because like I almost suggests something much creepier than anything I think is actually going on there. Uh, you know, but like that would be particularly amazing if we still had like well defined Italian American neighborhoods and non Neptune. You know, that's like that this is a really important part of people's identity that like Yeah, and, and they serve what we, we would identify today as like British cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds that sounds about right. Yeah. So it's like look, I don't know. It could very well be that uh, that there are um, that you know the things that we might be tempted to you know that like religions in 500 years will be very unlike religions right now or that like if there's still human civilization in 5,000 years that uh it's like if we could like be transported there and get a glimpse of the stuff that people believe we would have like no idea whether to call it religion or not uh because because it would be it would be like so elusive to our categories I have absolutely no idea how to how to figure out whether that would be true or not. You know, in, in advance, I think I sort of think you probably can't. But the uh, but I think there's a there's a sort of more basic point that survives that, right? In other words, like it it could be um, that like okay, sure, you know, maybe you know Christianity, you know, won't won't exist uh, in uh, in a few hundred years or whatever. I mean, again. Maybe, maybe not. I do think that, like, sometimes related to the point about how things arise in certain historical circumstances, but then survive in others. Like, 
you know, I do think that sometimes when people talk about like what they think would happen under socialism, they, uh, I think they make this sort of weird inference to, um, from like, you know, just because we're organizing, uh, you know, relations of production differently, that doesn't actually mean we've like shaken an etch a sketch on all of previously existing culture, you know, I mean, stuff, you know, like, um, that's, you know, like the, like, various things that you know various things that came into existence earlier in history will still exist but um but yeah i mean i I think that whether or not christianity you know exists in the fully automated luxury communist in the 26th century or whatever uh or whether or not even like theism as we would understand it still exists then uh I, i i do i do think right that it's that I do think that there are some good reasons to be skeptical of the idea that like everybody's just going to be like a, you know, like an atheistic materialist with, with no, um, you know, without a, uh, uh, you know, like who doesn't, who doesn't believe some sort of, you know, metaphysical story that helps them make sense of the world. Right. Because the, the, and all that's like, for instance, in in Europe, the percentage you can get for like non-religious or atheists can really extremely vary, depending on only if you go off like the percentage of people who say there's no God, um, which is normally quite large. The percentage of people who say there's no religion, which is normally huge, um, to have, sorry to have no religious beliefs. Uh, but then if you disclude, for instance, all the people who say that you know there's some spiritual force or whatever. Uh, then you have a lot less atheists, and the people who actually say they're atheist, atheist, is normally is not very high in any country. No, I mean um, I don't see outside of. Yeah, I mean actually I don't know what the atheist, atheist number is for like China. I mean I know that's like the largest. I think it's like forty percent or something. No religious affiliation, but like even European countries we think of as super duper secularized, the actual proportion of. Of people who like, use words like that, to, you know, it's like I never see much above like ten percent. Uh, they, so yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, well, I mean, the the, the definite definition that's used there is kind of spiritual but not religious. Uh, so I guess what you're saying is you would count those people. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe in some kind of force or whatever. I, that's that's religion, and you're kind of just to try and work out. Yeah, the definition yeah, I think religion. so. I think that the uh, I think if you believe in some sort of spiritual force or whatever, uh, then. I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, look, I think it's a little bit of a gray area, right? Because it's like, I, I kind of want to know more about exactly what you're saying. Um, I remember to uh, to pick on somebody I like here, uh, the, in, uh, I think it was, I think it was in the 2016 election, or it could have been 2020, but uh, Bernie Sanders at one point was asked about his religious beliefs, and he just sort of did this, like, paragraph of, like, you know, I don't know, like stuff that like maybe thoughts that occurred to him while taking mushrooms in 1975, you know, that it's, right. you know, it's like, well, man, you know, it's like, I think everything is connected and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, I have no idea what any of means, <laughs> whether it adds up to any sort of religious belief. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I think that like... Right, that, that, that sounds more like I want to win an election. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> that, that's really yeah, yeah. That, that, that if I just say, you know, that if I just said no, uh, that that's that's you know that people won't like that as much. Uh, yeah. That did, did you see um, DeSantis being asked what like his favorite part of Catholicism is, and he, he gives like the most evangelical answer possible? Oh yeah, I did. That's like it's like. Oh, my favorite part of Catholicism is like this line in the Bible how all that matters is faith. Yeah, it's like, it's like my, my, mine and my wife's personal relationship with God. And you're like, <laughs> what the I'm, fuck are you talking about, man? That doesn't sound very Catholic to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah, so so I do think like there's a lot of, there are a lot of like shades of gray here um, because sometimes... <laughs> You know, because sometimes it's just like uh, <laughs> uh, it's that um, sometimes I think what people are expressing is that they basically don't believe in anything outside of material reality, but like 
it it sounds harsh and unpleasant to them to like to set it quite right. I, I don't think there's ever going to be a hundred percent for metaphysical naturalism, <laughs> and if that's what we mean, then yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it sort of becomes more interesting the more you go into like something a little bit more specific, right? You know that the uh, that um, you have like um, you know, I mean, in a way, this gets back to what you were talking about about the Church of England earlier, um, because I, I think like as much as you know, as much as non-naturalistic beliefs about the universe being persistent even after the end of class society would to, you know, I mean, that's already revisionist relative to, you know, the idea that, you know, we can end religious illusions if we end a condition that requires illusions where that means class society. But, um, but, on some level, it's not that interesting a claim. I think that the more interesting claim might be that you're going to get the sorts of things that you might be tempted to call strong religious belief, um, even if you know, even if it doesn't have to be the specific kind of strong religious beliefs that exist right now, because God knows culture evolves and blah blah blah. Right. So I think that um, you know, I, I, I do wonder, even with regard to like the Anglicans and all that stuff. Um, about that distinction between just not believing anything nor pretending to uh, believe anything that, as in the sort of like you know uh humanist chapel kind of kind of thing uh versus sort of believing stuff uh and i i wonder how much the you know the sort of believing stuff options are kind of kept alive by the energies of the people within them who who believe the the most, right? Because there is like there is a spectrum, like within like Anglicanism, right? Like uh, I mean, right, Anglican, a lot of Anglicans are pissed off with the Anglican Church because they're like, we believe in God and shit. We like we believe <laughs> what's written in the Bible. So don't be so gay. Yeah, Peter Hitches is an Anglican, right? Right, um, and uh, you know people. Uh, you know, and, and then, yeah, people who, and sure, that doesn't mean there aren't Anglican, you know, priests who, if you ask them, hey, just to be clear, what exactly do you mean by God, won't say things that almost sound like Bernie Sanders uh, being, uh, being interviewed in it. Like, that's certainly true. But then, like, I think there's a lot of shades in between Peter Hitchens and that guy. Uh, and and I do wonder if, uh, <laughs> I do wonder if you need, a certain amount of belief that's you know at least a little bit closer to uh, to the you know the Peter Hitchens you know end of the uh, end of the spectrum to to keep the the institution going. I mean, if if everybody is only showing up on Christmas and Easter, right? You know, it's like the then I, I don't know if it quite works that way. Like you know, you you need to uh, you need to have some people who are more into it than that and you know and i do think that you you also have like um, you also have people like i think you have patterns that will play out over time of p of individuals and families and whatever sort of maybe drifting to being not at all religious and then like you'll get like a revival of religiosity and then you know people who like don't want to give it up entirely don't want to tone it down from that and you know whatever like you know but like i, I think there is gonna you know like i i think you can get like some pretty strong religion in the mix uh without having to have material deprivation fuel it and one obvious reason to think that is that in the society where we live right now, like, you know, there are lots of people who, um, who have, you know, are not really economically struggling in any way, you know, who, uh, who have, who have very materially comfortable lives, uh, and, you know, who become like super duper intensely religious and, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think the, the, the definitions you gave, I think are all, good for a minimal definition like it's very hard to define religion it's not just us being silly here 
like if you go in the concept of Wiki, of <laughs> the concept of Wikipedia, the concept of religion article on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it's a yeah. lot of vague posting and being like, well, different people have different ideas. Um, <laughs> and it's changed throughout history and it's expanded in the Roman times and something else, which is, you know, when they start talking about Roman times, you know, in articles, there's no like, current consensus. Um, but I think that the idea of kind of another life or another realm, another world, this kind of idea, and that someone or maybe something in terms of like karma or whatever is in charge, or if not in charge, is like, yeah, right, keep an eye on things, you know. It, th- those are kind of, um, I think, minimal kind of conditions we could talk about, and I, and I agree with you that it will be very difficult for those things to wither away beyond before we get to some point of, of really high technology. Um, do you know about the culture series? Uh, yeah, I think I read like one of those, the index. Right, because the culture series is where there is such a kind of high level of communism that it's impossible for banks to like, write any interesting novels within the culture. So they're all either on the on, right. the, thr- on the fringes of the culture, uh, which is the, the culture, it's, it's weird to say it like that, but the culture is like the, the state or whatever, as opposed to, well, it's not a state because it's communist, right. blah, 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 you know, but it's this civilization or whatever, which is in the, the galaxy in the sci-fi series, which is at such a high level of economic development um, that life within it is, is basically perfect, immortal, and so on. And I guess the question is, would these people need religion? Or would any of them feel the need for religion? I guess it would be a different drive. It would be some kind of uh, like ennui. Yeah, right. Uh, maybe not, right? I mean, maybe they wouldn't. Like, I mean, I think if, if you didn't, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, unless... Uh, unless they were really haunted by the thought that they would like their immortality only last until the death of the universe or whatever, uh, then like, uh, <laughs> uh, then then yeah, maybe maybe they wouldn't. Right? I mean, like, I think that I mean, I'm what I'm fairly confident about, um, you know, to the extent that you can do this like silly thing that there's like this element of what we're doing that's silly because we're insane. Um, you know, like the the essay is like doing a couple things and saying, okay, let's break down this argument that Marx makes and let's think about his assumptions. Some of those you can evaluate in sort of purely philosophical terms, but then it's like, okay, given this, does conclusion really follow? And like some of that judgment is empirical judgment, and you know, obviously, there's an extent to which you know any armchair judgments about that are, are going to be dubious, you know, but uh, since I'm doing it, uh, might as well go all the way. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, what I'm, what I feel fairly confident about is that like religion in some, in some form is always going to exert some appeal for people like us and by people like us, I mean, you know, people who, regardless of their economic conditions, right, you know, are, um, you know, like only live for a little while and, you know, and experience various sorts of tragedy and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's like that, that the, that like religion will exert some appeal for us and thus those of us who enjoy arguing about such things will be kept busy doing so for the duration. Uh, That much I feel super confident about. Uh, The more you start to mess with the people like us, uh, the less confident I am in that judgment. I mean, by the time you get to people who are essentially immortal uh, and you know, and, and like have really insulated themselves from the sorts of tragedy that we take to be constitutive of the you know human experience, then it's like, yeah, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe those people wouldn't need it, right? I mean, maybe uh, maybe whatever kind of existential ennui they uh, they experienced, you know, that like would be so different that like their solutions to it would have nothing in common with what we think of as religion. Yeah. Well, I'm always going to be an atheist. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing I think about. I'm like, I did realize reading the article, I was like, some like deep part of my brain was like, well, they're wrong. So obviously they're going to get proved wrong eventually. Then I was like, wait, no, like people can just be wrong forever. There's no, there's no force which stops them. Yeah, exactly. That, no, there's not, there's the not a thing. God. 
yeah, there's no God, you know, there's no God of, uh, of like, uh, epistemic rationality coming down and smiting people for being wrong. You know, they can just, they can just be wrong. Um, exactly. There's the, the whole, the whole thing they're wrong about is thinking there's some guarantee that everything will sort of work out for the best. So, uh, so yeah, given that you can, you can definitely continue to be wrong forever in, in, uh, in, uh, in believing it. But, uh, but yeah, if, if I, uh, if I outlive you, I'm definitely going to, uh, to, to start a rumor about, uh, Stefan's deathbed conversion. <laughs> I received the word of Allah. <laughs> That would definitely have to be it specifically. <laughs> As people post on Twitter. Okay. Um, so what's what's next week, Ben? Uh, is it Gnosticism? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do not think I'm going to get it together to um, uh, to uh, to write about Gnosticism next week. It would be fascinating to do at uh, at some point, uh, but uh, I I know that right now. I don't have any thoughts about that except wow that's that's a really dumb thing to say. Uh that's not an interesting well, yeah, thing. To, that's just become a running joke, so I'm just looking to ask every week. <laughs> well fair enough. Uh, <laughs> but, uh yeah, so I'm not a hundred percent uh I'm not a hundred percent sure yet um that um the you know, I was looking, uh, I, I have an idea about what, uh, what it might be. Uh, I was, I was reading, uh, the, uh, the national review because I'm writing something for Jack about a different, uh, national review article. And I saw this, uh, national review, uh, um, article, uh, uh, called uh, Across the Spider-Verse, Free Will Over Fatalism. I thought, okay. okay. <laughs> um, it's entirely possible. events. It's, it's entirely possible that, uh, that this is going to be, you know, this is going to be entertainingly confused enough that, yeah, there, there uh, that you know. really interesting kind of metaphysics that you often have in comics. I think it's not the, the Spider-Verse is not the first one to have it, this idea of like, you can change some things, but not other things. There's, so that's some that some things are kind of canon events, which I guess is um, the stuff that they've written about in detail that they don't want to change. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, also, uh, Ghost of uh, Gary Lattis, uh says among the GN words, Miyoki uh, is much preferable to Gnosticism. So perhaps on that thought, we can pack it in. I've already, I've already decided to start sitting sideways on my chair. Nice. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>